Welcome to the GTN Coaches Corner. We're back again to answer more of your questions that you have for your own personal coaches. Um, we'll obviously help you with anything you're struggling with, so leave us your questions below. Uh, today's questions, we're gonna run through a few, give you the best answers we can come up with, uh, and hopefully they'll help you on your triathlon journey. So I'm try not to bicker too much. <laughs> so straight on to the first question. From Wojciech Bus, he's got a question about climbing. When should you remain in the aero position when climbing? When should you sit up and climb with your hands on the handlebars? And finally, when should you stand up and just climb out of the saddle? Well, firstly, climbing in the aero bars is great. It's great for strength um, and just that kind of general power application through the pedals. Fantastic for training, but when it gets to racing, we kind of need to adopt a slightly different method. So obviously once the gradient kicks up enough and you start to slow down enough, you probably want to be coming out of the aero bars partly for comfort, but also for speed. Now, generally speaking, and this is very general, when your speed sort of dips below 15 kilometers an hour, that's when kind of weight becomes more of a factor rather than aerodynamics. That means probably coming out of the aero bars as you start to dip below 15 kilometers an hour, but also just kind of be sensible with it. You may even find at 20 kilometers an hour as you're going up a steep in, um, incline, you might just want to get up out of the aero bars and just even perhaps at times get up out of the saddle. Although I would limit that as much as possible and just try and keep that pedaling efficiency and economy kind of there and nice and fluid. Um, but yeah. That's an, important, an important note on changing your position out of your aero bars. Ideally, all the people will talk about the wind tunnel and say, stay in your aero position. It's the most aero at any speed. Uh, and that is true. But when you're talking about a long triathlon, a small change in, in the muscle use can make a big difference to your overall endurance and how long you can go. So even if it's a minute or two of sitting up, changing your position and then getting back into your aero bars, do that at a hill where you're getting the least penalty for it aerodynamically, but don't be afraid to change position a few times when the course allows for it. Yeah, a couple um, of actually really important bits there because um, if you take something like Ironman Florida, which is notoriously kind of flattish course actually a lot of the bike times are slower than some of the lumpier courses out there because of exactly what James just said there on those lumpier courses you're distributing the workload over different muscles and groups and parts of the muscles so um, that's really good but also I remember Cam Worth actually saying that exactly what you've just said there making the most of having to get up out of the aero bars for corners, stretch the back out, the legs, take some water on, use those opportunities and then get back into the aero bars for when it really counts and make the most out. Exactly. And then his final part of his question is standing. When should you stand? Um, and the answer to that is as minimally as possible for two reasons. One, standing is going to take tire out your run legs and you need to save those. Uh, that's essentially the same action as running when you're standing out of the bike. Um, but you can still use it occasionally. And that's when you really are going through a little punchy climb and you can just, you know you can push through over the top, keep your pace high, keep your, your uh, overall speed high over the top of the climb. Um, it's worth standing and punching over that climb rather than trying to grind it out in your aero bars or even just sitting. Uh, you should use standing, but use it sparingly as possible because uh, you wanna save those legs and that position. But again, like we just said, changing your position is very beneficial. So even if it's a few seconds of standing out of your out of your saddle, that might give you another 30 minutes of staying in the aero bars, and that's worth a lot of time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, moving on, David Copeland has said, any guidelines slash expectations to allow, adjust for heart rate training pacing when in hotter or humid environments? For example, during a run yesterday, it wasn't overly hot, low 70 uh, degree Fahrenheit, but humidity was 100% and was having a hard time trying to keep um, to pace or heart rate down without feeling like much more than um, walking pace. I'm gonna throw this one to you because you've just come from South Africa, probably a little bit more experience. <laughs> Although I think I can jump in. Um, sure, well, it's a good question, especially at the moment, because hopefully summer's gonna hang around in the Northern Hemisphere for a bit longer, seeing as I just moved here. Um, but everyone handles heat differently uh, and everyone's gonna adapt to heat differently. So don't beat yourself too, up too much if you're really struggling in the heat where your mate is just kind of cruising along as if it's a normal day. Uh, that's quite normal. Uh, there are major physiological differences that happen when you get hot. Your heart rate's gonna be higher, your breathing rate's gonna increase, uh, your sweat rate obviously is gonna increase, but some people are gonna lose more minerals and stuff with that sweat rate, which will affect their performance. So, and you can't really control any of those things 
bar actually being in heat and training and adapting to it you know yourself and you might never have been exposed to it if you were a kid if you came from a colder climate so you can't beat yourself up but you can adapt so the starting point is to lower your expectations in the heat don't go out and do your run on a really hot humid day and expect to run the same pace you run in a nice cool crisp morning it's just not possible nobody runs the same pace in the heat that they run in the cool it might look like it when you see elite marathon is running on a hot day or even the Kona pros running a, the Ironman marathon and they're running at 240. Uh, but they would have run a lot faster than 240 if it wasn't that heat, that hot. Everybody runs slower in the heat. So don't beat yourself up. Start there with lower expectations. I, then, I, well, I can actually talk from personal experience a little bit here because this is how I got to know James from going out to South Africa and training in the heat a little bit more. <laughs> and I would often go out for two to three months. And I can tell you by around the two month mark, each time I went, there was almost like this switch that happened for me and I suddenly found that actually I wasn't sweating as much I could go out for longer runs in the heat so I mean that took me two months to get to that point of running. It wasn't the start of the autumn was it? <laughs> Probably <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but um, but equally like sometimes I'm doing workouts indoors here in the UK and I haven't got enough um, ventilation or fans on and I notice just this switch I lose all the power and it's horrible and it's very and you can't recover from it once you get to that point. No so. but like Mark says you can adapt to it so everyone's body will adapt Unfortunately, some people will adapt a bit better than others. Not everyone's going to have the same adaptation. Um, some people will adapt a whole lot very quickly. Some people take a lot longer. Um, some people just won't ever adapt to the same rate that other people will. But everyone will see some ad ad adaptations. Those are earlier onset of sweating. So basically before your body overheats, it'll start sweating to cool you down before it actually gets to the point that it's too hot, which is great. You'll lose less salt in your sweat, which uh, once you're adapted to the heat, which is obviously beneficial for your electrolyte balance. Um, and then you will actually just have a general lower perception of heat. So on the same temperature day, you won't feel as hot, which allows you to push a little bit harder and, and your body won't slow you down so much. Uh, so everyone gets those adaptations. You've got to spend time in the heat. You've got to put yourself in it. But the way to do it is to get into the heat and then slow right down. Start slowly and slowly build up. Don't expect to run the same pace that you always ran. Run a bit slower. As you've managed a decent few runs at that pace, you can then start increasing towards what you used to be doing uh, in the cooler weather. And you'll, you'll notice the adaptations come. And before you know it, hopefully, like Mark did at the end of summer, start of autumn, he'll suddenly start feeling great in the heat, so. <laughs> All right, great stuff. Uh, next question, Simon Moore. How do you stop stopping? Uh, <laughs> for instance, um, he, he can stay focused um, for a few months, then kind of just hits a bad patch where life just seems to get in the way, starts missing runs and, more, and loses that morning routine. Um, now, if something gets in the way of training and life, to be honest, that's fine. Unless you're a pro, it's cool, it's okay, I mean, Triathlon should be fun. It's a hobby that you're trying to fit in and around your life. And again, that's a really important thing to get your head around and grasp is that the training should be fitting in around your life, not your life around the training. So you want to make sure that the training plan that you're following is realistic and allows you to be consistent with your training. And what we see a lot of people doing is they embark upon this crazy training plan that looks fantastic um, but is perhaps pushing things a little bit too much and they and get a month down the line like I just cannot keep doing this I haven't had a social life for the last month my partner's having to go at me every night because I'm not here so you just got to be realistic with it um, and in interestingly with this question I think there's a hidden issue that's inside his question here I'm not entirely sure that this is a laugh getting in the way of training so much as a lack of motivation getting in the way of training because <laughs> yeah. he's talking about after a few months life gets in the way of training and what might be happening is he's setting his goals far too far out he's setting goals for six months time or a year's time and he's getting a few months of training which is great because he's motivated and he's focused on that goal but the goal doesn't get close enough fast enough and you start kind of losing that motivation and that's when you suddenly find a week's gone by and you haven't got yourself out of bed to do that training session that you were supposed to do and you're missing more and more training sessions. It's not necessarily life getting in the way. If you don't have the motivation to go out there and do that program because it seems too far away or you're not seeing the gains you were hoping for, you will find excuses. Life will give you a good reason to not go out mm. and do that training program. I, so the, the, the answer there is obviously to pick goals that are far enough away that you can reach them, but close enough that you can keep motivated from the day you set the goal all the way up to the goal and not 
hit that peak, run out of motivation, stale, stagnant, start dipping down because then you'll never get to your goals. So even if it's setting a little process goal along the way, something that you can focus on in six weeks time, eight weeks time, keep your motivation to there and then switch to the actual goal, which is in another eight weeks time. Yeah, and I also think um, now more than ever, this is probably something that people can relate to with COVID, races being canceled on them, and suddenly these goals have disappeared. Um, and it can just seem like a very long process of just training for what? Um, so adding these little process goals in little challenges along the way um, and that is where I've kind of suggested to a lot of people actually just picking something random out a little challenge maybe it's a route that's going to challenge you rather than an actual race and a date to work to um, and also maybe the training that you're doing you may need to just mix up a little bit more rather than doing the same thing week in week out with slight progressions in them Maybe change it up. Don't do your speed workout on a Tuesday. Just change the days round or change the workout. So that can make a big difference if you are yeah. training for a prolonged Or even just the location. Time. Just go do yeah. it somewhere you've never been before. Um, cool. Our, next question. Our next question, yeah, from uh, Kodeba. Kodeba. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> I've always wondered if beginning runners should worry about their posture or wait until their conditioning is improved to where they can at least finish the 5K in under 30 minutes or so. Kind of a just run mentality until you're good enough. Uh, so it was interesting. Um, this is an old one, and a, but an important one. So we've kind of revived it. We found this back in the annals of the questions that we got. Um, the, the answer is there's no such thing as a magic runner's pace beyond which you are now a runner and you need to start working on the things that runners work on, um, like posture and your stride and, and form. As soon as you put on a pair of running shoes and you go out for a run, you are a runner. It is now time for you to start thinking about how you run and fixing anything you can to make yourself a bit faster. And if one of those things is posture, start working on your posture. Watch some of the videos we've made, for example. Uh, fix your form, work on your form, work on anything that's gonna improve your running because you're a runner now and you wanna get faster. Brilliant. Very positive answer there. <laughs> um, a final question from Bethany Blount. Um, I'm finally able to consistently do negative splits in my run workouts, but it's still impossible off the bike because of the difference in cadence. As the run progresses, my cadence and speed slows, then the lead settles in. Maybe um, we can get some tips from Coach's Corner to help with this. Um, now, oh, yeah, in short, heavy legs off the bike is absolutely expected that happens in triathlon but that is where brick sessions can come in and it's sort of kind of i think where the name comes from because your legs almost feel like bricks i don't I'm know that or you put in one workout on top of the other well um, there's so many or whatever is professor choose. brick or whatever is i don't know there's so many um <laughs> arguments out there for that. Uh, apparently that is what the reason. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, but basically, um, trying to doing these brick sessions can sort of prepare you better, so that you um, you're basically well not not adapted, but you're prepared for how it feels, so that you are prepared to sort of push through that feeling and that lead sort of leg feeling, um, and also find your rhythm and cadence with it. Talking of cadence, as you get to the end of the bike ride, we've mentioned this before, but just trying to increase your cadence ever so slightly so it's in line with your run cadence. That can just help with the feelings as you're running off the bike. Yeah, um, she's talking about her, her, her cadence slowing down mm. uh, as she goes through the run leg, and that's why she can't run efficiently anymore. And I, I'll probably find it, it's the opposite you're collapsing, you're getting tired, you're getting heavy because you've already taken all that spring out of your legs uh, on the bike. And so your cadence is slowing because you can't push off as hard anymore with, you, with each step. It's not so much a, a matter of how do I keep my cadence up, it's how do I keep my spring up, how do I keep my strength up? And that is by training that, by training that strength, that uh, ability to run when you're tired. Uh, the best way to do that is obviously to do it with brick sessions, but you can also do that with other run run specific workouts such as hill running, which is very good for, for running off the bike because you are using that strength that you need uh, for the back end of, of a triathlon run leg. Um, yeah, and talking of brick sessions, just start by building them up very gradually. So really short brick sessions. Also really like Tim Don often talks about a soft brick. So basically, um, even during the winter when you're way out from racing, you could go for a run after your bike, but rather than it being this very serious run off the bike, you kind of go in, you maybe have a cup of coffee, then 20 minutes later you go out for your runs. So you still got a bit of fatigue from the bike and just sort of eases you into it. So you're not doing brick sessions year round. Um, but yeah, you can build them up gradually. You can even start doing workouts within those bricks 
sessions off the bike. Um, and yeah, it's um, yeah, can really help. How, how many cups of coffee is, t is too many bef before you guys do that? <laughs> well, yeah, that's, I, th I guess that's personal um, before it starts affecting it. Once I've had one, I'm not sure I'm going for the run. So. And then the one final thing that actually helped myself, um, a coach a long time ago gave me a bit of a cue for my form as I ran off the bike. And it sounds odd, but the cue was arrows. And that was basically in re regard to the shape of the legs sort of pointing in an arrow direction. But that was enough for me, like as I started to tire and found my cadence dropping off the bike, I'd go arrows and that would suddenly bring my posture up and I'd, I'd thinking more about how I was running. So just Maybe we should way. do a video on, on mental cues to keep you focused. That would be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. All idea. right. Well, thanks ever so much, everyone, for the questions. Please do keep them coming in using that hashtag Coaches Corner. Um, if you've enjoyed today's video, please do give it a thumbs up. Make sure you get involved in the comments section down below and don't forget to subscribe just down below too.